Well, welcome to the local experience. And our guest today is Anton Hale, public relations expert. Welcome to the uh, local experience, Anton. Thank you. I appreciate being able to uh, come down here and be on the show. Yeah. You know, I was doing some uh, research and you absolutely have a fascinating background. How does somebody like you with a music industry background and lawn care service and so many things you've done, how did you get to where you are today? Uh, you know, it really starts with uh, my background, of course, how I was raised. Um, I come from a very ambitious family. Uh, my family, there's a lot of leadership and direction. Um, I'm a very creative person. So I guess as I was growing up, I wanted to explore uh, the diversity of creativity and uh, just looked at different things in life and different avenues you could take and opportunities and uh, really just tried to cross train myself, educate myself and grow to be able to experience different things in life. So that's how it really started uh, was was creativity and ambition, just pushing my creativity. Yeah. So. You know, it's interesting is that you made a comment about how many of our childhood dreams we never live out. Yeah. And one of the things that I was <clears throat> a little bit about me then is I was a kid. I was a six, seven year old kid. I dreamed of being an army officer and I remember my father encouraging that. Uh, he had been in the army for a short two year stint, but I actually pursued my dream and actually made it happen. It was cool. really interesting is that once I achieved my dream, I realized this is not what I was built for in life and that's okay. But I think how many times do we try to put our kids in a box and tell them, no, you need to do this. Yeah, I think there's a lot of social pressure. There's a there's a social standard. There's a, a certain curriculum in school. There's a certain narrative. Um, this is an interesting way to look at it, okay? We live in a very box system. We live uh -huh. in a very systematic, orderly system. It's very calendarized. It's very specific to dates and timelines. And even uh, penalties and fees and... Uh, repercussion if you don't meet the specific timelines. This is how it's designed. I've had to learn this, you know, through experiences in business and it's just the way life is. But because it's so systematic, because it's so organized, because it's so boxy, some of us out there uh, have very round minds uh -huh. and uh, we have very universal minds and we want to see far. And uh, it's interesting because when you think about um, the psychology of shapes, yeah. If you think about a box, mm -hmm. um, there's points of pressure. Yeah. So you may be going in a direction, but you come to a point of pressure and it's constantly limited. There's points of limitation. Uh, in a circle, it's universal. Um, it's far. It's consistent. It, there's not points of pressure and limitation. So sometimes when you take a round mind and you put it in a, it in a box and confine it, uh, it disrupts the uh, universal perspective of that individual. And so... It's an interesting confliction in, in society. You know, that's interesting. When I was doing career coaching, I had a client that um, was, it was a horrible uh, career. It had been 18 years in international tax accounting, had worked for nine di uh, different companies, could not, he just could not have anything stick. And when I started diving deep into his life, I started finding patterns <clears throat> of creativity yeah. all through his young life. And I said to him, I asked him, I said, why did you choose international tax accounting? And his parents said, he said, well, my, both of my parents were accountants and there was no way in heck that they were going to allow their son to get into a music career. Okay. So he, they told him he, he became an accounting degree, went through college and was miserable. And I finally told him point blank, I said, your parents did one of the worst disservices ever. And he started crying. He was a grown up man crying in my office as the realization that he was doing something he was never suited for. Right. And so one of the things is, is I told him, I said, you know what, right now you've, the die is cast, you're an accountant, but how about, what if you would practice accounting in a creative environment? 
and we worked for a number of months with him. He finally found a great career as the international tax accountant for real networks. And, and he talked about how creative everybody was and how the environment so now was he's, so different. now he's thriving. Now his skills are thriving exactly. because of, he changed his environment. Exactly. So he's got the ability and skills, but his, his environment was tormenting him. Exactly. Yeah. And how many people out there have limited themselves because they were told that this is what you must do. This is the way it must be and not allowed them to explore their creativity or explore yeah. their dreams. You're, you're exactly right. Uh, I remember specifically as a kid, uh, you know, growing up in a, in an environment where it was very disciplined, ranch setting, uh, country music everywhere you go enough to torment you uh, to where you don't even want to listen to music. And to be honest with you, the first time I heard uh, hip hop music as a child, yeah. it connected with my heart and it connected with my natural rhythm. And it connected with me as a very young child on a level that I decided I like this feeling. I like yeah. this, uh, this style. And throughout, throughout my life, you know, having an interest in that, um, I pursued it really on a level of uh, being able to create with music and actually right. started composing music, writing songs, even to the point where I started doing professional recording, doing uh, big shows, you know, five to 10,000 people wow. uh, opening for celebrity artists and really pushing the limits and being told you cannot do this because you come from South Idaho and and it's it's it is a, a different industry. It's you know it's a culture and and the thing about the hip hop industry though that a lot of people don't understand is it's a culture and it's an expression of different feeling and experience and life in different places. Yeah. And uh, and a lot of people don't realize that they don't really know what rap means. Rap means uh, rhythm and poetry. That's yeah. what that's what it is. So, wow. That I did not know that. Yeah. That's incredible. So what is it that you've done? How does your rap career directly relate to what you do with your public relations? Can we, can we, let's talk a little bit about that. Perfect. Okay. So um, I would say that my, my hip hop career and what I've experienced as far as an artist and my expression has really been a delivery of my feelings and built up energy and an outlet on uh you know, I'm a loud, expressive, creative person. So I found an outlet where I can where I can do it and I do good. Um, but what happened was, is as I grew into that industry and was challenged to be successful as an artist, uh, I was recognized by bigger, um, you know, parts of the industry as being, you know, a lot more effective with my marketing and advertising and creative side with, you know, content development. And, and this was recognized even over my creative expression as an artist. And so what had happened was, is I had eventually, you know, after working with independent labels and independent artists, I eventually started, you know, connecting with major individuals. And I got an opportunity to connect with the managing director of Universal Music Group. And so Universal Music Group, of course, is a, is a very strong platform for that industry. And being able to, um, you know, have that relationship and connection with the managing director, he was able to teach me uh, a lot about the music industry, how it worked, the business side, understanding the importance of PR, understanding the importance of marketing, advertising, uh, you know, really branding yourself. And, uh, and that's really the core, you know, the publishing, the PR, the marketing, the advertising, that's the core of your exposure. You know, regardless of how good you are really as an artist, you have to understand the business. This is where you're failing, Anton. This is where I can help you. Let me cross train you and let's exercise where you're best. Just yeah. like we discussed earlier. So he says, you know, you're real creative. You're a good designer. You know, you, you've got the right eye to, uh, to brand. You're really good at it. Let's cross train you as a PR. Yeah. And let's give you an opportunity to run as a PR. Do you want to be a come and go artist or do you want a career as a PR? Yeah. Interesting. So I grew. Yeah. I, right then I matured and I was like, you know, uh, I need to think more business. I need to I need to do something bigger with this talent. And 
so for the past uh you know especially three years it's it's escalated to the point where i've not only experienced doing it on a on a major level in the music industry but then i brought it back to a local level that's great you know i want to talk a little bit about you have an almost phoenix rising sort of story that i think really can inspire a lot of entrepreneurs why don't you tell us kind of the how that all came about and what are some of the things that you had to do when you were at that bottom and i'm going to let you talk that through rather than me going into details but tell us how you went from the down to the bottom all the way back up to where you are well i really have been through a lot and it's a huge complicated situation and and i would like to say that there's a lot of misunderstanding but it went in a direction of a criminal matter yeah and then it led to uh you know facing my first you know criminal situation a, a pretty big criminal situation and and having to defend myself and and prove to the world i'm not a criminal but yeah. through that process what were the biggest mistakes that you felt you made though um the biggest mistake that i made was over committing uh growing too fast my business was in high demand and i built up a lot of clients i mean prior to this specific event i had helped thousands of people because i grew up in this area so I've worked with thousands of people, had no problems. But in this specific time period, there was a lot of personal things that happened in my life. And where I'm accountable and where I'm responsible is I overcommitted to, to too much work. And a lot of that work uh, was near complete and I hadn't completed it. And because I was dealing with some court situations, because I was dealing with family loss, uh, another you know, a situation on government way where they'd shut it down and remodeling and getting inventory and just all this combination of things piling on me. That's where I was, was, was wrong, was over committing uh, because now it put me behind and now you've got frustration that develops because of me. Okay. Behind. So if I understand this correctly, you over committed, you basically yeah. sold way more jobs then you could handle and this is see this is the the i can see this happening so many times is that you want to say yes to everything and then all of a sudden stuff happens and you continue to say yes and it creates a problem do you think that was uh, what was going on or something like that what exactly was going on was i saw an opportunity a major opportunity of growth and i had huge encouragement from the clients i already had prior to the situation so there was people involved that I was working with. It wasn't just my business, but other businesses that worked in collaboration with, you know, developing the properties. Um, so I worked with other business owners. I worked with other entrepreneurs. I worked with a lot of great people that were really building me up to build up. So what had happened was, is when I was facing all these challenges and, and had all this commitment to all these jobs, um, I had the manpower. I had the equipment. I had... Uh, the experience um i had the ambition well having all that ambition and and ability i was ready to build my business and and really take off and so that's what i was doing i was really trying to to take off and during that exact same time uh everything hit me at once like what as far as is it what hit you uh well i was dealing with a, a custody situation uh, which was taking a lot of time um, I was dealing with family loss. I'd lost a number of people in my family. And of course, being from South Idaho, I was taking a lot of time going down and dealing with that. And uh, I was dealing with construction on government way. They remodeled the whole road and that caused a lot of problems for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was just facing a lot of things I'd never faced all at once. So how did it turn into a legal issue? It turned into a legal issue um, when I was accused of committing a crime, I immediately had to hire an attorney. And this is my first time ever dealing with this. I never had a criminal history. So I had to hire a criminal defense attorney. The, uh, the accusation was that I was taking money from people and not doing anything. And that was not the case because I have, you know, basically the paper trail and the evidence to prove that I was actually doing work with these people. 
And so um, what had happened was uh, a detective, um, I personally believe, misinformed uh, my clients, you know, on my position and, and really capitalized on my situation and turned a civil situation into a criminal matter. Uh, really with the intent, I think, to get a pat on the back or something. Um, you know, looking into her experience, professional experience, she really didn't have a whole lot of experience. So I think I was probably one of her big first cases or something. So, so any, she, 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 she basically manufactured a civil matter into a criminal matter. And I now was facing a criminal charge. And so I had to hire a, a criminal defense attorney, prove zero criminal intent. Well, through all that, that whole process, you know, I was really, really encouraging since day one to compensate my clients for work non-complete. That's the right thing to do. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm a criminal. I was not stealing from anybody. I was doing, building my business and trying to do all these jobs. So why do you think that they went ahead with prosecution against you, even though you were doing your best to compensate for the work that you had been completed? My initiative since day one was to compensate the clients for the work non-complete. I was told since day one by that detective, do not contact these clients or you will be arrested. You are not allowed to finish the work. You're facing uh, charges and that's where we're at. Yeah. And that made it extremely challenging because I actually did have some good relation relationships with some of these clients, even though they were frustrated that I was behind uh, they still were really looking forward to me finishing the work. It was almost done. A lot of these were almost done. So they were excited about the work. And of course, they're frustrated now because I can't go finish. Well, they want me to finish the work. I want to finish the work. I'm told I, I can't do that. And so now it turns into not a civil matter, but a criminal matter. So what's right to the people, of course, is to compensate them for what I wasn't able to finish. That's what I wanted since day one. And now you've got uh, you know, the, the justice system over here wanting, uh, there's a lot of pressure from the clients. Of course they're upset, but they're, they're not only wanting to make right of the matter, but they want prosecution. So it now turns into, it's about prosecution. Uh, and I can tell you why that happened during this process. Um, I was very adamant about being able to somehow communicate with my, my clients and get them paid back and not go through a criminal process. And we were able to come to an agreement to do a mediation. So we had mediation and we made an agreement. And well, during, I gotta rewind, during mediation, prosecution proposed a number of offers. And initially they wanted, uh, they wanted something that we weren't agreeing with. So we said no. Then they came with another offer and we said no. And during that process, I asked, you know, how are you able to just change, you know, basically the punishment, like a deal? How are you able to just adjust it right in front of me? Obviously, I'm not a criminal. Obviously, you know, you don't have a big criminal case and you're manipulating me to into a, a, a weird deal. Uh, so we proposed, you know, pay pay the clients back, no criminal charges, and move on with our lives. Well, they were really adamant to give me a charge. Uh, it wasn't even about the people. It, it was more about them having a prosecuted charge. Uh, and so uh, the judge even at mediation even mentioned to me, you know, based on my history and, and looking into everything, I was behind and I need to pay him back and let's move on. And you really don't need to be a criminal you know you're not a criminal anyway so the the deal proposed by them is you take a criminal charge and you pay back uh, the clients and uh, once you get them paid back then the charge will be reduced um, to a misdemeanor or whatever and my attorney encouraged me that that would be the best direction for us to go and um, and I told him that I didn't want to plea, and I was encouraged to to plea. But no matter what, I had to plea. So 
uh, I chose to submit an Alfred plea, which means that I did not agree with, you know, being criminally charged, uh, but I'm overwhelmed to plea. So that was my, my plea was an Alfred plea. And from that point, we had a payment arrangement set. Um, I began making those payments right after we had that agreement and I did not miss a month. I paid every single month. So, uh, I had the, uh, knowledge that my clients were being paid the restitution. Now by law, restitution is supposed to be paid every quarter. Our agreement was they'd be paid immediately. They'd already been waiting long enough and we've been going through court for years. And now we're at the point where they're getting paid back. So that's good for them and for everybody. Well, for two years, I made those payments, had receipts of every single payment. And, uh, and then I was summoned into court and, uh, and told that I hadn't made my payments and had a different printout summary, which was really interesting because the dates and everything were changed and didn't match any of my receipts for the past two years. And then they claimed that I didn't make these payments for the past two years and I need to be in prison. Um, wow. so I was really upset about that, of course, because now, you know, I'm thinking that I've been paying these people back and moving on with my life. We've all been through enough. Uh, people are getting paid back. I'm moving on. Now I'm going back through this and now I'm challenged and being told, you know, that I didn't make these payments and I've got receipts for every single payment that I made. Um, so when I began challenging it, uh, the court then put me through a process where they wanted to evaluate me and determine uh what they were gonna do to me to punish me so why did they not accept your evidence of um of receipts why we'll get, we'll get to that yeah. so um so yeah so then i go and i do you know uh an evaluation and they determined in the evaluation that i was best fit for probation and to continue making my payments because that was working uh well i thought that was working uh, that's what they they initially evaluated. Um, then I recently learned as we were going to court that they changed their their mind. Um, apparently, someone had called them and influenced them to just change their mind, and then they decided to send me to to prison. Um, so I was actually sent to down to Boise State and had to go through. I had to go through a six month program basically for the debt that I was paying back, um, but they had held it into a bond account and didn't give it to the clients. So you can imagine that my clients are absolutely upset that they've been waiting for years for their money and haven't gotten any of it because by design, they've been retaining the money to really design me like I haven't been doing anything and I deserve to be terminated. So I went to debtor's prison and uh, really went through a hell of an experience going going to prison. Um, that's something that I'd never done. Um, but I met some incredible people and I, I used it as a very productive time in my life. Yeah. Went through a lot of education, training, had a great opportunity to mentor hundreds of people who were in way worse positions than I was. Mm -hmm. So I changed some lives um, and really made a difference with my time. Give me some examples of what you were able to do in prison that helped people's lives transform? Because to me, this is a fascinating part of your story. Well, in prison, it's a whole different environment. It's a very cold environment. Um, it's very dark. There's not a whole lot of emotion or any creativity or ambition. Uh, it's a very sad place. It's confinement. Um, there's a lot of people that are there that shouldn't be there. And there's a lot of people that are there that know they should be there. Uh, so it's a whole different world. It's a different beast. And um, as far as as far as prison goes, you know, it's there's politics to it. There's the the house rules, and there's the ground rules, and they're two different worlds. And um, when I was there, I saw a lot of depression. A lot of people gave up hope. A lot of people felt like there was no. That was it. That there's no hope for their life business owners, entrepreneurs, creative minds, free thinkers, some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life were in prison, surprisingly. Interesting. Very successful people. There was even some people that were in there that were very successful people, but they just made some different choices and then were there. So I've met some really intelligent people, but uh, to answer the question, get back to the question, 
there was a lot of people who uh, really have no encouragement and they're just tormented all day because unfortunately some of the staff are control freaks and they're only there to to play control freak and have a bureaucratic mind and there's no emo emotion to bureaucracy so some of these guys that are in there really have no encouragement and are, are tormented so i made it a goal to bring them encouragement to you know show them that uh we're all here together and we're all going through this together and it's gonna it's gonna be hard and um i i had a hard time myself you know the hardest part about anyone going into an environment like that is being separated from the people that you love that is more of an imprisonment the rest of it really just pissed me off you know it educated me but it really upset me but the the, the true prison is being divided from people you love that's that's a, a a huge lesson. You don't ever want to be separated from the people you love. Isn't that incredible? And then when you go into that environment too, like it says, it's a whole different politics. So uh, it's a survival game. It's it's different. So then, what what are the things that you did that you know? For like for example, I think you told me the story about um, doing some uh, systematizing of what was going on and you got rewarded by the warden Tell oh yeah well you know having having the time there there's a, nothing but time so you're gonna either use your time or waste away i used it to the fullest not for myself but for others so because i chose to mentor people uh, i helped tons of guys you know get their geds encourage their geds um taught taught a few guys how to read um I educated myself in, in many areas and other language and was able to, to communicate with other people. And so that was really fun. And, uh, but after mentoring all the inmates, the, the staff actually recognized me as a leader and they, uh, it was really an interesting thing, but the administration of Boise invited me to, um, to cross train on some of their new systems. They were going to implement their software. And they trained me to be able to not only train the inmates, but to also train the staff. And so not only did I, um, you know, coordinate with, with the ground, but I coordinated with the house. And that was specifically because of my leadership ability. So um, I did so well with, with, with working with, you know, all the other inmates and, and some of the staff that some of the... Um, you know, the higher up people, they recognized me as a leader and surprisingly re rewarded me. Uh, I was able to leave the prison. I was able to have lunch with the warden. Uh, I, I was able to give uh, feedback on what they could do to improve, you know, the, the wonderful stay that everyone gets to have at such a <laughs> wonderful place. And so he, he really took me serious. Surprisingly, the warden really wanted to know the psychology of, of, of me and the inmates and just wanted some suggestions on what I could do before I left that would change the environment. And, and a couple of the things that I told him right out of the gate is don't identify us as inmate number. You know, you want us to come out back out in society. We're still people, you know, we, we we're all we're all still people we all still have a mother we're all still so that was one big thing i encouraged that they not identify people as just number inmate number that's incredible you that know you would think that i guess to me being on the outside they would have should have already known that but it takes somebody like you in essence, to state the obvious, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of that is because the bureaucratic mindset was identify as a number, makes it easy. Why get emotionally involved? Therefore, there's no emotions it, to bureaucracy. Exactly. It's, it's systematic order. That's right. what it is. And what I really learned, and we'll be truthful about this, it's really a business. Yeah. And when you get into uh, what's really going on, um, it's almost like a business capitalizing on people's mistakes. Um, they get money and they get kicked back and everyone gets a piece of whoever's being housed in there and, and going through all that. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something, the projected budget for Idaho's prison system for 2021 is over $520 million. Wow. Yeah. 
but Idaho is ranked nearly lowest for education funding in the nation. Wow. And Idaho claims to have no money for infrastructure improvements or uh, proper maintenance during our horrible seasons. And so we have no money, but yet we have nearly a half a billion dollars uh, going into imprisoning people and caging people. Wow. The solution to mental health issues in Idaho is caging people. Uh, when there's an opportunity to develop programs for counseling uh, for certain substance abuse issues or mental health issues or things like that, those are the directions that I think a lot of the public and, and people really want. And there seems to be this, you know, small circle politic business lobbyist involvement. You know, it's, it's big business. It's one of the biggest businesses in Idaho. So uh, it's interesting, you know, there's a lot to it. It's a real complex situation. Wow, that would be like a two hour program to go over that. But um, let's talk a little bit about, so you get out. So six months, you're out, what happens? Well, uh, surprisingly, when, when I got out, um, I was really in a challenging position because of course you lose everything. You lose your home, you lose your vehicles, you lose your inventory. You lose everything and uh, and you have to start over. And surprisingly, I had so much encouragement and so many people that believe in me and knew me and love me that that's what really got me going right out of the gate. When I came out, uh, I had not only my prior clients wanting me right back on board, but I had the opportunity that was, you know, when I connected with uh, Richard Whitehead, the running candidate for Kootenai County Sheriff. and he was great you know he recognized my whole situation more so recognized my skills and professional ability in pr and said you know uh you've been through a lot and you deserve to move forward with your life and uh, i believe in you you know and so to have actually an official or, or a running official you know looking at you like you're not just worthless to the world or just a criminal uh, he saw beyond that and gave me an opportunity to apply my skills to his campaign. That was a blessing. At the same time, I had, you know, celebrity artist Young Buck, you know, gave me an opportunity to exercise my skills. And, and I was able to do a national press release with him right out of the gate in spring and, and give him national exposure. So between the music industry and between the local politics and between local businesses, I had so much encouragement and support. And it was really an attitude like, hey, you know, sorry you went through that, but we need you to work, get to work. And, yeah, it, and so I've been busy ever since I got out. I've been working so hard. I really have. I've, I've been working to, to make right of all the wrongs, help everyone I can, uh, apply the best of my skills and ability, and just let the past uh, be a, a hell of a learning, learning experience. It, yep. was, it was hard. Yeah. And Xen, like I talk, talked about, uh, the, the, the success is a terrible teacher. It teaches us that we can do no wrong. We have to fail. I mean, that's the whole you know, idea of the Winston Churchill comment of success is not permanent. Failure is not final. It's the endurance to keep going You're until right. you push through. And I think it's perseverance. Yeah. It's like it you, you, you have to have an internal discipline. It's like intestinal fortitude. You, you have to you have to tell yourself that no matter what happens, no matter what storm it is, no matter how bad it is, no matter how beaten you are into the ground, you will not stop. Yeah. And when you don't stop, you, you surprisingly, you'll go through all your trials and you'll look back at it just like I'm looking back at it right now. And I'm so proud that I didn't give up and that I defeated it. And I'm so grateful that I had so many people encourage me. Uh, so having all that encouragement and that self-motivation, which is super hard to do, it's really a discipline. You, wow. you have to take a deep breath and you have to say, all right, I'm, I'm facing a major storm, but I'm not going to fail and I'm not going to fail all these people. Wow. Because all these people believe me and even all the people that don't believe in me, uh, I'm going to I'm going to prove myself and I'm going to overcome this and I'm going to make it right. That is incredible. So it's yeah, it's it's been a, a real journey and it's uh, the most important thing I can tell anyone out there is, is faith. You have to have faith mm -hmm. and uh, you have to have confidence yeah. and, and no fear. Exactly. No fear whatsoever. So what does the future look like for you? 
I'm so optimistic and excited and blessed and grateful to even have the opportunity to be, to be right where I'm at. The future is gonna, going to be successful. Uh, you know, with everyone I'm working with and the direction I'm applying myself and as hard as I'm working, I'm bound to, to achieve success. And that success is, to me, is achieving all of my accomplishments. And you know what? That story of going to prison, coming back, and still being recognized for the talent, the skills, and the heart that you have how many people out there are in the same situation they've been beat down they've been driven down whether it's their own fault or somebody else's and to me your story is that ultimate encouragement that says you know what doesn't matter where i'm started from it doesn't matter where i am at it's how can i get to that future that i know is so bright the you know it's the crazy thing is is when i look at my whole situation i have to consider there is people out there that have it so much worse and it's important for every one of us to have um you can and it's almost like an excitement for life so it's no matter how bad things are no matter how bad it's going to be or what storm you're facing if you can be excited for life and be excited about what you're doing and get other people excited and really just encourage excitement and encourage success and encourage other people's success and really push love uh it makes a world of difference it really does with with your success because when you encourage other people's success you will be successful yeah and yeah and that's to me i guess i see the power of giving when you give of yourself yeah you will get so much more in return i there's a problem that people have out there is that they have the poverty mindset well i can't give anything and and when people says well i don't have the money to give it's like who said money it's not money it's who, what about time time what about energy influence yeah. what about anything that you can contribute to make that world the world around you one little bit better a very very successful man that gave me a lot of direction and encouragement when i had started my business um he told me that the best way to become successful no matter what you're doing is to make those around you successful Mm -hmm. and to always encourage their success and to be there for them through their failures and i never forgot about that because this guy is doing really well for himself and he he was really selfless to tell me you know you're the people around you that you encourage and the people you involve in your life if you make them successful you will be successful yeah. because you have the mindset and you have the heart and you have the right direction yeah and this is one of the things i tell business owners is that your number one job as a business owner no before anything else your job is to make your people one little bit better every single day i like it yeah, yeah. that's your job I don't, everything else and how hard is that to do it isn't it's not and, it, it, and do you feel good if you do that of it, course you of do. course you do but the problem is no, a lot of people don't make it deliberate they get they walk in they do their stuff they leave and they expect their team to magically get better on their own and that's not going to happen unless you get involved you talk to your people yeah. You find what needs to help them to be better, whether it's a system, whether it's training, whether it's process, whether it's a word of encouragement. Encouragement is so powerful. Whether it's a word of motivation, yeah. Yeah. anything. Encouragement will change someone's life. Yes, Not just in business, but just their whole mind frame. Yeah. It's even a smile sometimes. Well, you you know, mean, I don't smile very much, but well, when I do, it, it actually you, helps people. Here's what I want, Anton. I want this interview to be an encouragement, everybody that's watching this, I want this to be an encouragement to them and a motivation that says, you know what, I have it inside of me. I know the talent's there. I just have to get out of my own way. You have a you have a brilliant story and a brilliant example of thank doing you. just that. It's been a rough ride, but thank you for the compliment. It, it means a lot. I hope that this story and everything uh, that I've been through 
I hope that people can find some encouragement with it and just realize that no matter what's going on, you're going to face challenge. You're going to face heat. You're going to face criticism, hate, any, any success comes with pressure. So if you want to be successful, it, it comes with a battle. Yeah. Yeah. My life has definitely not been a cruise boat. It's been a battleship. So exactly. Well, thank you so much You're for uh, coming here and here today. I'm excited to get this message out. Thank, thank you, you yeah. so much. Thank you guys. I appreciate it.